founder, uh, David Michael Bogey. I'm going to tell you a story of growing up in the computer world from my early days at University of Illinois in the late 70s. I became an assistant professor at UCLA in 1978. I moved to Loyola Marymount in the 80s to New Mexico State University in 1996 and on to today. I moved from the f IBM key punch cards to I from the f IBM key punch cards to IBM quantum computing myths that are here today in 2024. So I want to explode these myths and point out the quantum bullshit that's rampant when it comes to the quantum computers. Here's my story. I went to the University of Illinois as an MBA student on a fellowship in 1975, and I had never touched a computer before, never barely even seen one except through a lab window. But I decided to type out my dissertation and the University of Illinois Technological Services, right, had the cyber units from 1970, the Cyber 173, the 174, and this is in Champaign-Urbana. These machines were uh, on the mainframe and connected units, and it was a really nice way to get out of punch carding and job control language. More about that in a minute. So here's some pictures to see uh, what a lab looked like for students. And when I would go in and uh, it's type out my dissertation, I was the first student at University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana in 1978 to print out a dissertation on a Diablo printer. Before that, you had to hire a typist to type it out on special paper. Uh, they delayed my actual graduation date a year until 1979, trying to figure out what to do with the first ever Diablo printed computer generated dissertation. And finally, they, they said something stupid like, um, go down to the copy store and take your print out from the Diablo, then copy it onto paper sheets and then bring it back and we will certify it. So, you know, initially at UCLA it was punch cards and I went to uh, working in the cyber stations to my first job as an assistant professor at the Anderson School of Management at UCLA and I was horrified. They didn't have the cyber 174, 175 stations. Instead, I had to type out job control language on punch cards and sit down to a punch card machine. Oh my God, it was primitive. I had these decks of cards and boxes and the first few cards was a job control language and you'd hand it to somebody and they would run it through the system, then you'd wait probably overnight to get your job out. And if you made one little error in a punch card, you had to do it all over again. So long about 1981 at UCLA, I purchased one of the first Adam Osborne computers. It was a portable computer. It was like a sewing kit or a sewing machine in a case, and you walked along with it, and it weighed, I don't know, 40 pounds. And you used these floppy disks. I mean, they were really floppy, bendable, and you had 5K in one for your programs and 5K in the other. Can you imagine trying to work with 5K? Uh, it was ridiculous. But storage devices, uh, they, they continued... And to grow, and we went from optical devices and Blu-ray to uh, magnetic hard disk and floppy disks. That's where I come in the story. And then later in life, I had flash memory with USB and memory cards and SD cards. A lot of SD cards. Oh my gosh! So here you can see a diagram showing kind of the evolution from the floppy disk to the that was big, an 8-inch. That's what I used on the 
Osborne, and then it went to a five and a quarter, and then a three and a half plastic ones. I've got stacks of them in the garage. And then you had the CDs and the DVDs and the USBs and the SDs, and then the cloud computing. Oh, cloud, they charge way too much money for that. Get yourself a USB stick. Anyway, about 1982, I bought one of the first model 5150 K Pros and a K Pro 2 after that. And it was great. It was uh, one of the first microcomputers after the Osborne. Osborne went bankrupt and went out of business. There's a team of engineers for the K Pro. You right. They had been actually working as designers at IBM. Uh, William Lowe and Philip Don Estridge in Boca Raton, Florida. Well, at UCLA, uh, eventually, uh, you know, we got a, those desktops with the big screens, and they were initially green screens, and uh, they, they were primitive. And so eventually, uh, Anderson School of Management invested in something beyond the uh, punch card system that I encountered in 1978, 79, 80. And... We were so desperate at UCLA, some of my buddies in the Anderson School of Management started soldering their own personal computers and get, the, get these green boards and slot it down and solder connections and order, thing, order the parts. You know, and this was a time before the real internet. You could dial up to somebody's house who had a computer and see things and dial down and that's all right. But eventually, we got into the 1990s, and we had these uh, floppy disk machines that were bigger, the big monitors, and, you know, 50 pounds of junk on your desktop. And eventually, you know, I got one of the early PowerBook systems here at Mexico State University. I had to argue with the dean. The dean says, oh, I only want desktops. I want to make sure faculty are in their offices. It was total bullshit. Uh, so before the MacBook, um, computers looked like this. And then we had the desktops. And finally, we got these beautiful color things. I was the first in my college to get, get a MacBook. And I said, look, I... I want a MacBook. I don't want a desktop. I, I move around. I do research. I'm a researcher. I don't sit at the, the desk. I, they had a rule at one time, 20 years earlier, that you couldn't leave the campus to get a haircut. You had to stay at your desk. It was ridiculous. So there was uh, this movement of computing, and we're getting into this, the quantum computer and you can see all kinds of YouTubes by uh, these woo-woo wannabe scientists or scientists that have given up science for woo-woo. And they enter the, the quantum bullshit. And you can trace the hist history from 1999 of the formation of the quantum computer and IBM Q. It happens in uh, 20. 23, 2020, and different versions of it. And they got a computing roadmap to move from the Falcon in 2019 to the Hummingbird quantum computer in 2020, to the Eagle in 2021, to the Osprey in 2022. I guess they like birds or something. And then the Condor, 2023. And it looks like this. You know, and everybody thinks that the whole thing, not everybody, but those that don't know about it, think that quantum computers is huge things from ceiling to floor with all this stuff around it. But you see this lady, she's touching down there toward the bottom. That little piece is the quantum computer. The rest of it above is this cooling thing to get it out down to zero degree temperature. Uh, and here you can see a bigger map of the 10-year plan to get this quantum computer to happening. And in 2033, we're promised this modular design supercomputer of a bunch of small, four smaller 
quantum computers together. But let's talk about the difference between myth and reality. really like this book, Quantum Bullshit, How to Ruin Your Life with Advice from Quantum Physics, because I, I did a lot of writing about consulting and quantum storytelling and quantum woo-woo. And there's a lot of quantum woo-woo, quantum bullshit in the consulting world. And all these people are doing startup firms, but then you have the bigger firms, and I'll, I'll show you an example here, some of the bigger firms that are big consulting, billion dollar consulting companies. And like KPMG is one of the ones that's excelling and try to get people into small business startup consulting and mainframe, not mainframe, but manufacturing the hardware and doing the software for the quantum computer. But, you know, one of the big advocates of this notion of quantum supremacy, of how quantum computers will change everything in our life, is uh, Mishashio Kaku. And man, he's charismatic and dynamic, and you really want to believe his uh, quantum storytelling about quantum computers. Uh, but it's not entirely accurate. Here's some key myths, and I'll put some links to if you want to find out more about these myths. Number one, quantum computers can solve all classical computer problems, you know, that I was showing you on my little computers and the mainframes. Well, in fact, quantum computers speed up solving only certain very detailed problems. Myth number two, quantum supremacy spells the beginning of the end of classical computing. But in point of fact, classical computers, like the ones I've showed you in my history, won't be completely swept aside by these quantum computers. Myth number three, quantum scale cryptography provides complete data security. And you can use these quantum computers to uh, defrag and get into anybody's security information on any computer in the world. But in fact, it's the cryptography of quantum computers isn't all that safe. It's not able to do any of these things. And quantum computers require super low temperatures to operate the disturbance of the environment's temperatures and keep the noise and interference down. So you have to have near absolute zero temperatures. And that's pretty darn expensive to have. And you're not going to have this on your desktop any, any, time, any decade soon. So some more myths. Uh, quantum computing will mean the end of normal computing. We've already said that that's not going to happen. We're going to be stuck with our desktops and our laptops and our MacBooks and the rest of the Dells and HPs, et cetera, for quite a while. Quantum computing can run program codes similar to classical computing. Well, no, they need a whole new software algorithm and it's not going to break down uh, cybersecurity and cryptography anytime soon. Quantum computing will destroy the cybersecurity world, it is said. But it's not there yet. Not likely to be here. It's, it's quantum bullshit. More quantum bullshit. Quantum computers might attain consciousness. Well, this is just quantum woo-woo. And, you know, go read some science fiction books if this is what you think quantum computing is. Quantum computing will commercially be available in 15 years. Well, I don't think so. I'm going to predict. No, it's not. Stay with your laptops. Quantum computers will be better at modeling the real world scenario and do finance forecasting so we can go get rich in the stock market uh, and agricultural models and weather and everything else. Well... It's not happening. So read the book Chris by Chris Ferry, who's an actual quantum physicist. And this is all quantum bullshit, he says, you know. And it's really, really interesting, the reviews that he's been getting. Let me tell you about some of the chapters in the book. He's got, he uses terms like quantum fucking energy, quantum matter waves, fucking matter waves. Here, Ferry... Uh, is jokingly revealing and in satire that, to debunk these notions of the quantum computer and, and uh, goes after the quantum woo-woo. We have no fucking clue what is going on, he says in this research that's happening now. 
uh, even the uncertainty principle, people uh, don't understand it and they misapply it in quantum consulting. I will add quantum consulting to the mix and in quantum storytelling that's being done. See my video on the four types of quantum storytelling. Uh, the, the fucking zombie cat, Schrodinger's cats, explores misuses of Schrodinger cats in chapter four. And according to Ferry, uh, usually come down to the imprecision of our language in these joking examples, thought experiments. He even quotes the, the show that uh, in the chapter, we can begin to delve into the worldview titled, If You Hate Something, like torturing the cat, set it free, open the box, you know? And as some uh, comedian was saying the other day, how long can a cat live in a Schrodinger box? Uh, do you feed it? Are you leaving it there forever? I mean, time matters. Finally, we get to the most important of the things for quantum computers in chapter six, this many worlds problem. You hear uh, these people talk about the many worlds hypothesis that these computers will, quantum computers will be able to calculate all possible millions of variations in seconds. And it would take a, com a classical computer a hundred years or a thousand years. His argument against this is uh, it's convoluted interpretations. He says, shut up and calculate because calculation works, bitches. Now I'm quoting some of his terms and I'll probably uh, have to put 50 cents in the jar for, well, maybe uh, maybe like $10 for the amount of cursing here. But Ferry rejects all under the many world interpretations. Um, so, uh, we can understand why the authors are beginning to reject this notion of quantum computing. And yeah, maybe someday it will happen. I mean, yeah, we would like uh, new generations of computers to do something cool. But quantum consulting right now, KMPG is just touting the IBM line on quantum computers and a bunch of other uh, companies, the big billion dollar ones and the startup ones and the smaller $100,000 uh, quantum computing. You can see hundreds of them on the internet. Everybody is is using the word quantum, but it's all quantum bullshit. All right. And this is David Boji, and I'm doing an episode from Quantum Dash Storytelling. All right. And have a wonderful day and keep getting innovations and computers. Don't buy into them.